So with an understanding of oxidation and redox um, reactions, we're now going to move into talking about um, galvanic or voltaic cells. Um, either descriptor is acceptable, um, and you'll see them in different texts, um, but please understand that they're referring to the same type of setup. Okay, so now that we understand redox reactions, why do we actually care about them? Well, the reality of it is, is that these redox reactions, when they're in the same container, um, are actually passing electrons uh, between the two half reactions. So if we break uh, the reaction that we see here into two half reactions, we have one that's a reduction and one that's an oxidation. Um, so basically one that is uh, picking up the electrons and one that is releasing the electrons. Um, and, and basically, when they're in the same container, this transfer occurs, um, but the transfer of the electrons isn't useful with respect to work. However, if we separate them, a different story can be seen. So if we separate the two uh, reactions into what are known as cells, okay, so um, basically we have our um, oxidation process and we have our reduction process in two separate areas. So what will end up happening is as the oxidation process occurs and releases electrons, the reduction process uh, will be occurring um, on the other side. So electrons are going to be transferred through the wire that connects the two um, cells of the half reactions. Um, however, what ends up happening is that the reaction is going to stop uh, pretty much uh, immediately because there's going to be a very rapid buildup of charge. Okay, um, in terms of the products produced, and basically you're not going to have a balance of the charges present inside um, the two half reaction containers. Okay, so we can actually alleviate this stoppage uh, by making a few adjustments to the cell. Okay, so in order to set up this uh, galvanic or voltaic cell and create a situation in which the electron flow can continue um, and not be stopped by the charge buildup, what in order to make that happen, we have to balance um, the charge of the ions that are being produced in each of the half um, cells. Okay, so what, what we have here, okay, is we have a situation in which the Fe plus 2 ions, um, as they're being oxidized, produce um, Fe plus 3 ions and the electron, excuse me, uh, that flows through the wire that connects the two cells. Okay, so what it's in, what's ending up happening over here is that we're increasing the positive charge um, in the left hand side of this container. Um, and the opposite is happening over here. Um, this side is becoming more negative, or we can look at it uh, with respect to being less positive. Okay, so in order to counterbalance um, this situation, we're either going to use something called a salt bridge or a porous disc. So what ends up happening with the salt bridge is we'll have some sort of um, salt, like sodium chloride or potassium chloride or something of that sort that's not actually involved in the redox process. And that salt bridge will basically um, counterbalance the negative and positive um, charge buildups that are inside each of the cells. So uh, basically what you end up with is, you know, if we had um, sodium chloride as the component of our salt bridge, in order for the charge to be counterbalanced, um, the chloride ions would come over to um, the positively or the, the positive charge buildup, and the um, positively charged ions from the salt bridge would come over and help balance um, the negative charge buildup. So basically, uh, the salt bridge uh, allows there to be a counterbalancing uh, feature inside the galvanic cell. Okay, in a porous disc, basically what we have is a disc that um, acts as an interface between the two cells. Um, and what happens is, uh, in these types of uh, setups, you actually have the ability for positive and negatively charged ions to flow through um, the disc, and uh, usually it consists of you know smaller ions. Um, and with that kind of flow allowed, it allows that charge balance to occur similarly um, to what we see with the salt bridge. However, um, it's being, uh, it's utilizing the components of the actual two reactions as opposed to um, an extraneous uh, component. Okay, so now that we understand the basic components um, of the galvanic cell, um, 
let's talk about what actually ends up happening in the galvanic cell, um, as well as some of the vocabulary and nomenclature you want to be familiar with. So um, the galvanic cell, simply put, uh, takes chemical energy, so basically the oxidation and reduction process um, between uh, products, or excuse me, between reactants, um, and converts it into electrical energy. So um, when we have the reduction process and the subsequent flow of electrons, um, that's the conversion of the chemical energy into the electrical energy. So um, basically we break up the um, half cells into what's known as an anode and a cathode. And an anode and a cathode both uh, uh, have redox reactions or half of the redox reaction process occurring. Okay, so on the anode side Okay, that is where oxidation is occurring. So oxidation is occurring on the anode side. Um, electrons are subsequently being released. Okay, on the cathode side, okay, um, reduction is being um, carried out. So reduction occurs on this cathode side. Electrons are being um, picked up by um, the reaction, the half reaction that it that is in that half cell. Okay, so um, the way that I remember this combo is N-ox, okay, so anode oxidation, so like an ox, like a big old um, <clears throat> animal, okay, and then reduction at the cathode, red cat. So N-ox, anode is where oxidation occurs, red cat, okay, reduction occurs at the cathode. Okay, so um, basically, guys, you want to be familiar with these vocabulary words, you want to make sure that you understand the flow of electrons. Um, where they're originating from, i.e. the anode, and where they're ending up, i.e. the cathode. Okay, and also please be aware, guys, that just because I have this drawn in this manner, where I have the anode on the left and the cathode on the right, that doesn't mean that that's actually um, how this could be set up. I could swap um, the solutions, or the, sorry, the, the half reactions, um, and the reaction flow, although the electrons would flow in, um, the same direction, meaning from anode to cathode, um, they would actually be flowing in the opposite direction um, because we would swap the positions of the anode and cathode. So um, this is not standard. This setup that you see here is not standard with respect to where the anode and cathode are. Um, so that's not a standard thing. So you need to always look at um, which half reaction you have in which container to establish what direction your electrons will flow. Okay, so guys, this is just a really, really nice uh, picture of basically the process that's happening at um, the various areas or in the various areas of a galvanic cell. Okay, so remember where the oxidation process is occurring, that's going to be your anode. Okay, so in this case, um, for this half reaction here, zinc going to zinc plus two and an electron. Electrons are being produced. Oxidation is occurring, so electrons are um, being sent through this wire, okay? Um, on this right-hand side, we have our uh, copper plus two becoming copper solid. So basically electrons are being picked up. So we have a reduction process occurring at the cathode here. Okay, now physically speaking, there are these items that we haven't discussed um, called the um, electrodes, okay? And the electrodes can be made of various different um, substances. It, it, I'm not going to actually go through every example or detail, but um, you know, you're going to have a solid um, electrode. Um, your electrode is going to be made out of uh, some sort of metal usually, um, although it can be made from graphite. Um, in some situations, you will have electrodes that can match um, the types of substances that are in solution. Okay, so in this case, we're, we have a, a ox the oxidation of zinc. Okay, um, so our electrode in this situation is actually gonna be zinc. Um, the reduction of um, copper two plus ions to copper, in this case, my cathode can be made out of copper. Um, we could also have made them out of platinum, we could have made them out of graphite. There's definitely um, different examples of cathode possibilities. Um, in situations where you actually uh, can make the cathode out of the material that's um, consistent with what's in the um, half cell, uh, you, know, you definitely wanna use that type of electrode. Okay, but um, let's physically look at what's happening to the zinc electrode during this process. Okay, so remember, zinc solid, solid zinc is being um, oxidized. Okay, so basically what's happening here, um, this, this zinc um, solid is uh, basically giving up electrons, 
okay? And these electrons are going to follow um, the copper wire and go over to the cathode side, okay? And in the same time, basically, we are producing zinc plus two ions in solution. So as the zinc gets oxidized and releases electrons, it's also re releasing zinc plus two into solution, okay? All right, so it would make sense that on this left-hand side, on this anode side, a positive charge increase is going to occur. So remember, in order to counterbalance that, we have the salt bridge. In this case, our salt bridge is made out of potassium chloride, okay? And so the chloride ions are gonna come over here and help counterbalance that charge so the, the reaction can keep progressing, okay? Now, on this right-hand side, we have a copper ca cathode, okay? So we have these solid cap, uh, copper atoms, so copper in its zero oxidation state. And what's going to happen is that the electrons that have followed through into the cathode are then going to get transferred into the copper plus two ions that are present in solution. Those electrons get transferred, they reduce down this copper, and the copper subsequently um, sticks to the electrode. Okay, so um, in this situation, we're removing plus two ions from the solution. So basically, we're decreasing that positive charge or making this solution more negative. So once again, that salt bridge comes and um, the positively charged potassium ion helps counterbalance um, that charge decrease. Okay, so um, what I want you guys to think about is what's physically happening to these electrodes. Okay, so my zinc electrode, remember, as I oxidize zinc, the electrons leave, and the zinc atoms become zinc plus two ions. These zinc plus two ions are floating around in solution. So as this reaction progresses, as this oxidation occurs, the zinc electrode is going to be being used up. It's basically going to start breaking down because what's happening is you're physically removing atoms okay, and putting them into solution as ions as that oxidation occurs. On the right-hand side, on this cathode side, what's actually happening is as the electrons come down and reduce the copper, okay, those copper plus two ions become copper solid. And what ends up happening is they start adhering to the electrode. So what's gonna happen on the right-hand side um, is that the um, copper cathode is actually gonna grow. It's gonna get bigger over time, okay? So um, basically, you guys wanna be thinking about obviously the components, where the oxidation and reduction are occurring, what are these called, cathode and anode, Okay, what the salt bridge does, what, um, where those electrons, sorry, where those charged ions are going to go. So understand, hey, if one side's becoming more positive, the negatively charged thing in the salt bridge will go there. If it's becoming more negative, the positively charged um, salt bridge component will go there. Okay, um, and also, guys, I want you thinking about what's physically happening to the electrode. If you have an electrode that's made of the same um, components that are part of the oxidation or reduction process, you're going to have potentially growth or um, uh, basically dissolution of that um, electrode. So I want you guys thinking about these things. Um, and remember, guys, what we're doing here is we're taking um, advantage of these spontaneous redox processes, right? These electrons will um, basically be given up and picked up. Um, and we are doing this, or we're taking advantage of this factor, so that we can take this chemical energy and convert it into electrical energy. So this now brings us to the concept of cell potential, okay? So um, what we call the pull, or the driving force on the electrons floating, uh, flowing from the anode to the cathode, um, this process is known as the cell potential, or electromotive force. Um, and the cell potential is represented by this symbol, okay, or we'll sometimes call it the EMF. And basically, the unit of electrical potential is the volt, and that's why you guys see the voltmeter on, on some of the other diagrams we've looked at. Um, so a volt is equal to one joule um, per coulomb of charge transferred. Okay, so one, a volt equals one joule per coulomb. Okay, and we measure this cell potential um, or this electromotive force by the voltmeter that we've discussed before. Okay, so guys, make sure you're familiar with this conversion factor, okay, um, and that you guys are also comfortable, obviously, with um, both uh, cell potential representation or, uh, or uh, variable, um, as well as the um, descriptor EMF and, and basically this uh, truncated abbreviation. 
So just so it's clear, guys, I think it already is, but, you know, understand that the cell potential is measuring the electron flow um, from these redox processes, okay? And the electrons are always going to flow from the anode to the cathode. Remember, the anode um, is where oxidation is occurring, so electrons are being released, okay? And the cathode is where reduction is occurring, right? So electrons are being picked up, okay? So they're being collected in that component. So electrons are always going to flow from the anode to the cathode. 